afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Eric Kaufman for our next panel. First, my name is Samantha Hill. I'm the assistant director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities here at Bard College and visiting assistant professor of politics. Eric Kaufman, to my left, is professor and assistant dean of politics at Birkbeck College, University of London. He is the author of White Shift, which we'll be talking about today, Immigration, Populism, and the Future of White Majorities. He's also the author of Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth and the Rise and Fall of Anglo-America, the Decline of Dominant Ethnicity in the United States. He has contributed to the New York Times, Newsweek International, Foreign Affairs, New Statesman, National Review, and Prospect, among other publications. Please join me in welcoming Eric Kaufman. Okay, thanks Samantha, and thanks very much uh, uh, for welcoming me to such a beautiful campus and to the Arendt Center. Um, three sort of apologies to begin with. First, um, that I don't have a British accent, uh, despite teaching at a British university, so you don't get to have that. Um, uh, second, PowerPoint, yes, I'm sorry I'm using it, um, but I won't hopefully hit you over the head with it too much. And thirdly, uh, I am a social scientist, so I guess I'm breaking with that humanities uh, thrust of, of most of today. But hopefully, I can keep you entertained at least a little bit for the next 20 minutes. Um, so my book, as, as mentioned uh, by Samantha, is entitled White Shift. Uh, oh, okay. We, I think we had a request for the... Okay, right, okay, fine. So um, really what this term white shift is about, this is a book very much about the rise of right-wing populism and also connecting this to the idea of white identity. Um, the term, the title white shift is not just because my agent said we need to have a one word title, but it, it has two real meanings here. The first is um, in our lifetimes, uh, the decline of white majorities in Western societies, uh, North America and Western Europe. Um, you're familiar with the idea that, that whites, non-Hispanic whites will decline to roughly 50% of the US population around 2050. That's also gonna happen in New Zealand and Canada, and in Western Europe, it'll happen by the end of the century. And so that's a major, major change in these societies. And I'm arguing that it is this demographic shift that ultimately underlies what we're seeing in terms of the upsurge of right-wing populism. And it's very much connected to the immigration issue, which I'm gonna talk about a fair bit. The second meaning of white shift is really a much longer term uh, development, and I'm arguing that, um, that white majorities will ultimately give way to mixed race majorities, but that's not gonna happen for quite some time. So if you take England and Wales, uh, some work I've done with a demographer there suggests that the mixed race share, which is only 2% of the, of the population now, is, is still only gonna be about 7% by mid-century, and it's not till we get to the end of the century that we start to see a jump. It's up to 30% based on existing intermarriage rates. Immigration doesn't affect the picture much. And then very quickly after that, 50 years later, it's 75% of the population. So that's the sort of second, more longer term meaning of white shift is that the meaning of white is gonna change substantially to become what Mike, Mike Lynn talks about as being a beige ethnic majority. There's two real entities that I'm talking about in this book. One is ethnicity and the other is nationhood. By ethnicity, I'm referring to a community um, that believes itself to be of shared ancestry. We heard about the Jews and um, descent back to Abraham, for example. This idea of having a, a myth of origin is central to the meaning of ethnicity. Um, that means ethnicity is not just a minority thing, but a majority thing as well. And roughly 70% of the world's countries have an ethnic majority of at least 50% of the population. So this is a fairly widespread phenomenon in the world. And so the decline of white ethnic majorities in the West is the sort of first problematic of the book. The second, however, has to do with national identity. Nation refers to the territorial political unit. So the United States would be the nation. The ethnic majority would be white American, for example. 
even though white American is kind of a blend of different European groups that have intermarried together. Um, so when it comes to the nation, um, it's not just about the American creed, for example, but it is also about a whole set of secondary symbols, landscape, history, the ethnic makeup of the population, sports, all these sort of everyday, what are known as everyday symbols, are also part of the national identity of, of many people. And it's there that we're seeing more of the divisions emerging around the, what is the nation. Um, and people who are attached to a particular ethnic composition of the country, even if they accept that everybody, regardless of ethnicity, is an equal member of the nation, they may have a view of what is the nation I knew growing up, how fast is that nation changing, etc. And so that, too, is another, the nation is the second category I look at. So ethnic majorities and also nations and what I call ethno-traditional nationalism, which is attachment to a conception of the country that embodies a particular historic ethnic composition. Not the same thing as ethnic nationalism, which is, for example, what white nationalism is about, which says you must be white to be a member of the nation, and everyone else is outside of that. So it's partly moving to another category, which is not quite about ethnic nationalism, and it's not quite civic nationalism. Um, and so I'm interested in particular in how white ethnic majorities in this decline phase that they're in, in this uh, century, how they are responding to these demographic changes. And the issue of immigration is really the central one. Uh, if we want to explain the shift in politics that's taking place, the populism and the polarization. Now, if you look at this from the American National Election Survey, uh, sorry, political scientists love these sorts of charts, uh, and I work mainly with um, survey data. Um, what this really tells us is that Donald Trump's vote, for example, is not about the economy. I mean, this is white Americans, and if you look at this chart, you can see that down here we have your view on immigration from increase it a lot to reduce it a lot, and here we have your probability of having voted Trump in the 2016 elections, and you can see that if you want immigration reduced a lot, it's more or less a 0.8, 8 in 10 chance that you voted Trump, and if you want it increased a lot, it's sort of less than a 1 in 10 chance. That's an absolutely massive statistical effect. All these different colored lines are income bands. How much money do you make? Under 15,000 or you know, 90,000 to 150K? That doesn't make any difference at all in this model. Um, in some cases, with the Brexit vote in Britain, for example, Poorer people were more likely to vote to leave the European Union. That is a significant effect. So I'm not saying the economy doesn't matter at all, but it's really about immigration. And immigration, there's a consensus really in the political science literature that the immigration attitudes are not related to personal economic circumstances on the whole, income, job share, et cetera. So this idea that this is really about competition in the labor market is, I think, an extremely weak argument. Um, so then it begs the question, well, where do attitudes to immigration come from? And this is where I want to get into a discussion of things like white identity and also psychological factors, because these psychological factors are becoming increasingly important for our politics. The so-called open-closed cultural dimension is taking over, not taking over, but it is increasing in importance compared to the old left-right economic dimension around redistribution of wealth versus free markets, uh, which was a big issue in, in the second half of the 20th century. Still there, I'm not claiming that issue's gone away, but this new cultural issue is really reconfiguring politics in a big way. Uh, if you think of Britain, uh, where I've lived for over 20 years, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have almost an identical class makeup now, uh, which would have been unthinkable you know, in 1950, when really the Tories were the, the middle class party and the Labour Party was the working class party. But that's completely shifting, and it's shifting in all Western countries because these cultural issues, Brexit is reflecting that, uh, are leading to a, a realignment in politics. Um, so what on earth does this picture have to do with immigration attitudes? Anybody's workspace look like that? Um, <laughs> Well, it turns out there is a, an important statistical relationship. And what is that relationship? Well, this is, this is some data from um, the United Kingdom. And what this really shows is that if you are in favor of much tighter restrictions on immigration, then of the people who are in favor of much tighter immigration restrictions, 70% say their workspace is neat and tidy, 30% that it's messy. 
Whereas if you're in favor of much looser restrictions, it's sort of 50-50. That's a statistically significant relationship. And it has really to do with perceptions of difference, difference as disorder. This is the orientation that some, well, political psychology would refer to this as psychological authoritarianism. This idea of seeing difference as disorder and wanting to, to limit the degree of difference in society. Um, Here's another one. I'm Canadian, and so if we go about seven hours northwest of here, we'd see a lot of this kind of scene of cabins on a lake. The kind of person who goes to this would probably tend to return each year and go there on holiday. Uh, so the question for you really is, do you go to the same place on holiday each year, or do you go somewhere different? Again, a very powerful link to uh, views on immigration. I should, by the way, preface this by saying that this is restricted to 18 to 24-year-old upper-middle-class white British people. So we've screened out, to a large extent, age, class, and ethnicity as influences on where you go on holiday or how neat your desk is. Um, and what you see here is those who are in favor of much tighter restrictions. There is uh, almost 50% say they go to the same place on holiday each year. Um, more are about 10 points higher than those who go somewhere different, whereas amongst those who want much looser restriction, it's more or less three to one saying they go somewhere different on holiday each year. So what has that actually got to do with uh, politics? Because these are not political issues, messiness of desks, going on holiday somewhere different each year. What they are is a clue to a particular psychological makeup, which twin studies tell us is 50% genetic, actually. So we have a very strong genetic input through psychology into political attitudes. Jonathan Haidt has looked into this quite a bit, and in his TED talk, he says, well, what kind of person would want to join a global community welcoming people from every discipline and culture, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, well, that's going to be somebody with a particular psychological makeup, high in, in openness, which is one of the big five personality traits, and low in this desire for order, which is known as authoritarianism in the literature, or this desire for the present to be like the past, which is known as uh, status quo conservatism by writers like Karen Stenner. So this idea of seeing difference as disorder and change as loss is key to understanding the psychology, this conservative psychology which animates those who are more, or have a lower tolerance for demographic change coming through immigration and therefore tend to be more anti-immigration. And that tends to feed in also into other forms of identification. Uh, you may have come across these people, um, the British royal family. So um, the question becomes how, what kinds of people are very attached to family? and rate family as being extremely important. It's, it's important to, to preface this by saying, in the UK, family is not a political issue. That is not an issue that has been politicized. It has been in the US to some degree. Um, quite striking, actually, if the question here is, is family over everything. How much do you agree with that statement? Again, the people who want much tighter restrictions, it's sort of 70%, I can't even see that from here. Something like 75% uh, are agreeing with that and maybe only about under 20% disagreeing, whereas amongst those who want much looser restrictions, only 35% would agree with this statement and 50% would disagree. So again, another massive difference around the imp attachment to family. And Jonathan Haidt actually has a, has a recent paper, a co-authored paper that sort of makes this, you know, looks at this and actually shows that um, conservatives are more attached to family and liberals more attached to friends. And this is partly to do with uh, being attached to ascribed identities that uh, come through birth, which tend to root you in time and place, versus chosen voluntary uh, identities, which appeal more to a different type of psychology. So this sort of psychological basis is becoming more important for uh, ordering our politics, and especially around the issue of immigration. Now, I want to kind of segue here into talking about ethnicity and race, because there's a connection, I believe, through from family, attachment to family, to being attached to ancestry, and then being attached to race. Um, so, okay, I, I don't expect you to understand this right away, but what, I'm, what I've done here is I've asked a question which is asked on the US Census. This is from the, from the United States, and this is something that was asked I, only a few weeks ago. Um, I did a survey on this. So there's a question that says, what is your main ancestry? Is it Haitian, German, Irish, Jewish, whatever. Uh, and secondly, how important 
is your ancestry to who you are, your sense of who you are. Uh, and it turns out that the importance of your ancestry to your sense of who you are is a strong, incredibly strong predictor of the importance of your racial identity to your sense of who you are. And so whether we're talking about minorities or whites, if you say that your ancestry really isn't important, and as a Salvadorian or a Filipino or an Irish, yes, that's my ancestry, it doesn't mean much to me, the chance that your racial identity as Hispanic, Asian, black, white is going to mean something to you is quite low. Less than 2 in 10. Really low, for whether we're talking about whites or minorities. However, if you say that your ancestry, as say German, Irish, or, or quote unquote American, which is a major ancestry in particularly the southern United States, if you say that that's very important to your sense of who you are, amongst whites, then you, will, you have about a 6 in 10 chance of saying that white identity is an important component of who you are. And likewise, for minorities, it's even higher, um, and there are various reasons for that. But if you take Hispanics and Asians, if you're strongly attached to being Cuban or Puerto Rican, you're going to be strongly attached to being Hispanic. Part of the point of this is to say that there are, I think, very similar dynamics going on between whites and non-whites. That is, the attachment to white identity is driven largely through this attachment to ancestry. It is not principally about wanting to get more resources and power. So part of the argument here is it doesn't really make much sense to say, and, and the other point behind this is that people are more attached to their ancestry, their ethnicity, than to the racial group, which is a kind of supra-ethnic umbrella group. That also doesn't make, make a whole lot of sense from a power-driven perspective. If you see the world in power terms, you should be more attached to the larger, more powerful entity, which is the racial group, rather than the ethnic group, which is about ancestry. However, if this is about cultural attachment to symbols, myths, and memories, then the attachment to ancestry makes more sense because this is where the richness of the, um, the narrative and the, and the collective memory comes from. So I really think that this is kind of evidence that whites are really not that different from non-whites. Their attachment to race is very much driven through cultural attachment, attachment to symbols, stories, memories, etc. That then complicates, I think, an analysis that would tend to see whiteness as all about power and domination and would tend to stigmatize it as essentially about white supremacy and racism. It's not to say that there aren't bad things that can happen from identifying positively with a particular ancestry. You can be nepotistic, you can favor your group and discriminate against others. So I'm not claiming this is all fine. However, it does sort of raise a question mark around some of the interpretations uh, of white identity that put it down largely to domination and power dynamics. Um, and, and this sort of is a segue into some earlier research I did in 2017 in 18 countries, and this is just from the United States, where if you sort of extrapolate from this idea of racial identity as coming from that conservative orientation which focuses on family and ancestry, then what you see is a big split between those who value their white identity and those who don't. And we know from work by Ashley Jardina, for example, in her book White Identity Politics, that the degree of attachment to white identity is both a major predictor of immigration attitudes but also support for Donald Trump. And what we see coming in in addition to that is that um, there's a divide over whether this is seen as legitimate. Is it legitimate to defend your group's interests? Um, and the question that I, I put here to people is, uh, a white American who identifies with her group and its history Is this person being a um, racist or B, or sorry, yeah, you know, A uh, sort of acting in her group's racial self-interest, which is not racist, or two, being racist? We'll leave the don't knows to one side. Now, I have to confess I got this notion of racial self-interest from Shadi Hamid over at Brookings, who wrote a quite interesting piece in the Washington Post on this. So the question really is, is somebody who wants to reduce immigration simply doing it doing something that is rationally going to maximize her group's self-interest. Because very few European or Canadian or Australian people are going to come to the United States for demographic and economic reasons. Or is this actually a racist thing? And what you see is a very sharp split 
between particularly white liberals and white conservatives. So white Clinton voters with postgraduate degrees, 91% say this woman is being racist. Trump voters without degrees, it's about 6%. In Britain, leave voters, people who voted to leave the European Union without a degree, it's zero. Um, so they are, these are incredibly sharp splits, but they're not splits specifically about immigration. They're, they're splits over the morality of immigration. And so we have, what we have is two things going on. We have a polarization around how you respond to demographic change in immigration. Are you a person who sees change as interesting and exciting or change as loss? That leads to one set of polarizations, but the second overlaid on top of this is an interlocking polarization over the legitimacy of immigration restriction. Um, is it even legitimate to, to want to restrict immigration, particularly for ethnocultural reasons? And that is a second and perhaps even more burning split, but it's, it's sharpest in the United States, but it's there in all Western countries. On the, if you look at non-Western countries, the split is not anywhere near as strong on this ideological measure. So we have two sets of interlocking polarization layered one on top of the other. Um, and that then re results in something quite interesting. So this is a, a chart that looks at the share of white Americans who want to reduce immigration beginning in 1992 and moving forward to 2016, which is uh, when Trump comes into office. The blue is Democrats and the, um, the red is Republicans. And you can see that actually, you know, about half of Americans wanted to re reduce immigration, but the differences by party were very small. You know, five points maybe, expanding a little bit as we get out into the Obama era, but nothing really that dramatic until we hit 2016. And then all of a sudden there's this 50 point gap in opinion between Republicans and Democrats. Now part of that is because um, Obama voters who wanted less immigration, switched to voting for Trump. But in addition, and what's often not focused on, is that a lot of Democrats actually became a lot more liberal on immigration. And in fact, some of the most recent data we have for 2018 for the American National Election Study suggests almost 60% of white Democratic voters want increased immigration, which is really unprecedented in, in the data that we have. So you're getting this polarization, first of all, um, because you get conservatives who, who want immigration reduced, but then you get liberals who are reacting against, in this case, the in increased conservatism on immigration. And so you get this ratcheting effect and you see that polarization. That's starting to happen in Europe as well, by the way. You can see it in the latest European elections where both the, if you like, cosmopolitan liberal side and the right-wing uh, populist side both did better at the expense of mainstream parties. And that's, again, this cultural axis the so-called open-closed cultural axis overlaying and taking over to some extent from the economic uh, left-right axis. Um, okay, so really, this is, that's the, that was the last slide. So I, really what I've been talking about here is that the orientation towards diversity and change, which is deeply psychological, has a strong hereditary component. Um, determines whether somebody, or, or in, in many ways governs whether somebody processes immigration as a, as a nice thing and an interesting thing, as a stimulating thing, or as something that is causing insecurity toward, of their identity and, and is leading them to think things were better in the past. Secondly, um, as we've seen, the orientation towards white identity and the defense of group interests is very different. So conservatives see it as quite natural and normal to defend groups' demographic interests by, for example, restricting immigration. Um, liberals see that as racism. And this is, again, a misunderstanding which I think is, is leading to a second level of polarization. What I argue in the book is that we need to be able to have a conversation on this open-closed dimension because really it's not about open-closed. There's very few people who want an open door and very few people who want zero immigration. What it really is is a, a debate, it should be a debate about how fast what is the level? And we shouldn't have people saying on one side, anyone who wants a higher level is a globalist traitor. And on the other side, anyone who wants a lower level is in some way a deplorable racist. We need to be able to get past that binary black-white kind of thinking to saying, okay, let's negotiate over, let's reach an accommodation that satisfies as best we can both sides in this debate. Just as we have on the tax debate between people who want lower taxes uh, and less welfare spending and those who want more welfare spending, 
we can reach an accommodation. I know it's not perfect, but we should be able to talk about the immigration and cultural issues the same way we do the economic issues. Because otherwise, if we just turn it into this sort of contest, you're either a, a good person or a bad person, open or you're closed, then we get this pitched battle and this increasing polarization. So part of the book is saying that the second thing is the social psychology literature tells us that uh, attachment to in-group and hatred of the out-group are different dispositions. You know, if I'm a lawyer and I'm attached, or if I'm a professor and I'm attached to being a professor, doesn't mean I hate lawyers. I may hate lawyers anyway, but that's a separate question. Um, attachment to your in-group is not correlated with hatred of the out-group, except in situations of violent conflict. And so on the American National Election Study, we know that white Americans who are attached to being white are no more likely to feel cool towards blacks and Hispanics than white Americans who are not particularly attached to being white. Because partly, as we saw from those slides, the attachment to being white stems as a sort of emergent property out of attachments to, for example, family and ancestry. And so it's important to disentangle attachment to and hatred of. And there's an important paper by Marilyn Brewer called uh, In-Group Love and Out-Group Hate, which sort of goes through this literature. And it's got thousands of citations and this really decades-long psychology literature that establishes that these are quite different dispositions. Whereas if we conflate them and we think that any white person who actually has, a, has identifies with their group must hate blacks and Hispanics or, or members of out-groups, I think we're backing people into a corner. Again, citing more research here in experiments where you get people to read about a policy and then you add, and this is racist to it. Uh, there's a certain chunk of the particularly conservative electorate that will react very negatively to that and increase their support, for example, for Donald Trump and for conservative policies as a sort of reactance. And there's been about three or four studies that show this effect. So it's really not a good strategy, I think, to be pursuing. What we should be pursuing is a kind of middle ground, a kind of accommodation. And I do believe there is a way of finding an accommodation on these tricky cultural issues that are increasingly dividing Western societies. And part of the book really went, went looking long term is to say, um, ideally, conservatives would be able to see in the rising mixed race population a, continu a, a continuation of their ancestry, of their collective memories. See it as a positive thing, and liberals too can see this as a positive thing. A message that is saying more diversity is great and if you don't like it, you're a racist is guaranteed to go down badly with people who aren't psychologically wired to, uh, to prefer diversity. Everyone has to tolerate diversity. That's the hallmark of a liberal society. But to say people must celebrate and prefer is actually kind of not particularly realistic and I think is not a, a particularly sharp political strategy. Um, I think that's pretty much all I got to say, so I'm going to... Uh Perfect, perfect. Um, is that on? Is that working? Okay, good. Okay, so Eric, you're going to have to forgive me because I took off my political science hat a number of years ago and, and have, have been reading mostly Hannah Arendt. Um, so my questions might seem a little naive. And I want to start with a pretty straightforward question to kind of fill out the narrative that you're creating around all of this um, political sociological research that you've done and all these numbers that you've just shared with us. So it's just a, the first question, and just two parts. What is whiteness in the way that you are talking about it? And if there is whiteness as an ethnic group in the way that you're describing it. Is it legitimate to advocate for white identity and what does that mean? Great, okay, some, some really good questions. Everyone can hear me. Yeah, okay, so I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the term whiteness because I, I'm a fan of talking about white, whites as a racial group or an ethnic group, which are not the same thing. So if you think about the United States, American history, um, you had a dominant ethnic group in the United States prior to, let's say, Kennedy's election, which was defined by being Protestant and white, often descended from uh, early settlers to the United States. Catholics and Jews were outside of that, uh, but they were still white. So the, the re meaning of, of whiteness, I guess, racially is, is to do with phenotype and appearance, and I kind of think of it more like, you know, like the colors, you know, like, and so we can't necessarily tell when blue becomes green, that's a fuzzy boundary, but it's very much about um, 
physical appearance, whereas ethnicity, uh, which is about myths of origin and um, the cultural markers that mark up, in this case, Protestantism, was a boundary between the ethnic majority group and other groups. And so I think talking about whiteness obscures that nuance. Um, but with, as with any identity, I think anything taken to an extreme is going to be negative, uh, absolutely. And that could be true of ideology like religion or socialism or whatever, or liberalism. Um, so it's very important that any identity be moderate. Uh, and so I'm, not, I'm one of these people who's, there are some people who say, oh, identity politics is just the worst thing in the world, or, or there's people who say, no, it's a great thing. I think it, it's, again, going back to Jonathan Haidt's distinction between a, a common enemy version of identity that says, we define ourselves as Irish because we hate the English. I mean, that kind of identity is, I think, not a particularly good form of identity because it's premised on hating an, an outgroup. Now, maybe they deserve it, and okay, fine. Uh, but <laughs> if, if, it's kinda, if that's what, what you hang your identity on, then I think that's a problem. Uh, but then there's what he calls common humanity identity, which says, no, we're attached to our traditions and myths and, and memories, but we don't hate anybody, and this is just our culture that we want to. So I think I would be in favor very much of that second form of identity, and also that, that it doesn't transcend liberal principles. So this idea of equal treatment has to be maintained. So you're not going to just hire members of your own group because you're really attached to your own group. You've actually got to moderate that in line with liberal principles. Yeah, that's, that's great. So that. Uh, I had a student in one of my classes last week, and she said we were talking about Derek Walcott's Omeros, and she, she said, there are two Americas. She said there's the American history of imperialism, racism, and colonialism, and genocide of native peoples, and then there's Marilyn Monroe, apple pie, and baseball. She said one is good and one is bad. I'll leave it to you to decide. That's what she said to me. And I thought, it, I thought it was a really nice phrasing, and I think it cuts to part of what you're talking about there in separating out whiteness as an idea from the mythologies that are attendant to white identity in the United States. So just to kind of perhaps put it in the phrasing of Reverend Jackie from earlier, um, I think who brought this up, is it possible for white Americans that you're describing who feel their identity being <coughs> lost, um, is it possible to retain the mythology of somebody like, let's say, Jefferson, while acknowledging the history of slavery and racism in the United States? How do you see that playing out in the political sphere? Right, well, I think, yeah, the, the question here is, both are true, and what is the, what is the, rel how much should what we What are think? the both? What are both, of, well, both, both Americas? Are, both, are, both Americas are true. Um, the question is, when you wake up in the morning, what should you think about? And how much, do you, how much time do you spend thinking about each? That to, that's the important question. Is it the case that a white American should spend most of their time thinking about the bad stuff, as being their identity, or the good stuff? I'm of the view that they must acknowledge the bad stuff, but that the good stuff is, is something that, that can be foregrounded. So, and actually, and, and this is the same for any group. I mean, if you scratch most groups, you will, you know, if you scratch Mexican identity, uh, and you look at the history of Mexico, and, and if you scratch Aztec identity, and you look at what they did, you, know, you can go on and on and on. So I think this is a question not of, you've got different episodes, absolutely, but it's a question of, it's again like personal identity. You know, if I stole something from a store when I was 16, should I wake up every morning thinking about that? Well, probably not, but I should certainly acknowledge I did something wrong. So I guess it's about relative emphasis in your identity. That's how I put it. Yeah. So I just I want to put it in prac more practical terms, perhaps. So how do you think a fifth grade history teacher in a public school in New York City should be teaching the American founding? Well, in the... In my book, I have this term multivocalism, which I, I think, anyway, I'm trying to sort of, it's the horse I'm trying to ride, where I think, actually, you're not going to have a single hymn sheet mm -hmm. of national identity. Because depending on which ethnic group you're from, which class, which region, you're going to have a different view on the nation. And, and actually, national identity is very much something that comes from below, that people construct that suits them personally. There's a term called personal nationalism, which comes from a writer called um, Cohen in 1996, he's got a good paper on this, that we have a different lens on the nation. Everybody has a different lens. So there sh it should be more like a menu where you work your way through the menu differently depending upon, uh, you know, 
what your ethnic background is, what your ideological background is, etc. I don't think there should be this single hymn sheet that everybody must recite. Uh, and that gives enough flexibility, I think, for those who are attracted to Jamestown and Western settlement. That can be important for them. Other people, it could be slavery or it could be something else. I, now, you have to learn it all, but I think everyone's going to have a different view. I've done, again, some research on this. If you look at the the American history is a major part of the American national identity of, is more important for white Americans and to some extent Latino Americans than it is for African Americans. Also, Republicans and Democrats emphasize different aspects of America in their national identities. So again, something like diversity will be, or immigration will be, will be ranked higher by Democrats than Republicans as part of their national identity. And that's fine, absolutely fine. You, can't, you don't need everybody to identify in exactly the same way. So one of, the, one of the topics that came up in your talk was immigration and what kind of role immigration is playing in our current electoral politics um, and thinking about perceptions of disorder um, and immigration views. And one of the things that you talk about um, for quite a bit in your book is the need for long-term refugee camps to right. deal with the current refugee crisis um, that we're facing. And so one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading your book um, and thinking about the current immigration crisis in the United States and the concentration camps along the border that have been set up for migrant children is how are you thinking about that in the context of the upcoming presidential election? And, you know, if, if you are, um, I'm assuming, given your talk, you know, you don't desire to have Donald Trump reelected in right. 2020, what, how, how, can, how can we as not Donald Trump voters, I'll just to throw the political net, <laughs> cast, cast it wide there, how can we talk about immigration in a way that will lessen these attitudes? Well, I do think that, I mean, I do think that the sort of liberal side needs to have an answer on immigration. I mean, if, and, and certainly in the case of Brexit, mm -hmm. um, the Remain side just were told to change the subject whenever immigration came out to the economy. That didn't work in the Brexit case, and I don't know in the U.S. case whether that will work. Mm -hmm. I, you, there needs to be an answer. Like, so I think taking the border seriously, how are you going to control unauthorized immigration the Democrats need, would, would have to have some answer to that question, I would say. I mean, clearly in the Obama period... Do you period, have an answer? Yeah, I mean, I think that there has to be border security. I mean, if you go back to the Obama period, Obama did take that issue seriously, and I would have thought that, that the Democrats today should kind of do what... You know, I think there are lessons from the Obama period. Now, you may not like what he did, but I actually think you have to reassure... You know, there's a chunk of voters who want to see something done about illegal immigration, and it's not unreasonable. I mean, if we take other countries in the West, if anything like the numbers of illegal immigrants that exist in the U.S. existed in Britain or France or anywhere else, I mean, this would be, yeah, there'd be a hue and cry. So actually, the U.S. is extremely tolerant on this issue if we compare it to other Western, even Canada, quite frankly. So, um, so I think there has to be some policy of, and so there, one of the things would be, okay, better cooperate, not stigmatizing Mexico and stigmatizing, the way Trump talks about Mexico is very counterproductive. If you, what you want to do is cooperate with Central American countries, with Mexico, mm. in a way that will help to solve, a, solve the problem. You want to have enough resources to provide better facilities on the border so you're not putting people in cages. So these are all th ways in which the Democrats could distinguish their, themselves from Trump, but yet have a message on the border. I think that would be sensible. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience, so we have some time. I see a number of hands um, here in the, uh, with the plaid, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I thought your, I thought your um, statistics were interesting, but I wonder um, have you considered the possibility that those are second order effects that have resulted really from the neoliberal policies that have eliminated many of the institutions of social solidarity and economic security in our country so that people have to find a way in which to deal with the fact that they now live much less connected and more insecure lives as a result of our government's policies? 
Yeah, I think there's there's no question that gl neoliberal economics is. I think it's an upstream factor that that. But but I guess I'm more analyzing the proximate determinants. Um, so I would agree with you that particularly in Europe, maybe in the United States, it's harder to see. And the reason I say that is we would expect people who have more job insecurity or lower incomes, therefore, to be more likely to vote for Trump, which they're not. Now it could be that they're cross pressured between their sort of um, economic insecurity and other cu cultural uh, issues. But we haven't seen, honestly, haven't seen a huge amount of evidence that people's economic precariousness per se is a factor in right-wing populism. It is a factor in left-wing populism. Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, for example, or Syriza or Podemos. But in terms of right-wing populism, I haven't seen very compelling evidence that this is a major factor. Of course, it is, it is a factor. I'm not saying it means nothing. Um, but I just don't think it's as, as important a factor as these sort of cultural, psychological ones around the immigration issue. Um, but can I, I just yeah. want to jump in there from the American perspective, because, you know, since the 1970s in the United States, we've been dealing with economic stagnation. We're essentially experiencing an existential crisis in this country right now. Suicides in record numbers, drug epidemic deaths in record numbers. And, you know, so I'm thinking of, per, you know, like Arlie Hochschild's book, right, Strangers in Their Own Land, where we, where we get a portrait of a low-income community in Louisiana that's voting for Trump, that has a very right-wing populist agenda, um, even though we, you know, from a liberal perspective might think that it's, you know, counterproductive to their own immediate interests. You know, and so I think I'm not sure how we separate um, economics from from viewpoint. You know, from r at least racial identity, um, especially in the history of the United States, when we're talking about what's motivating voters. Well, I I, do, I know that. I mean, I guess I'm fairly. You know, I tend to stick with what the data tells me, and it's not actually telling me that the economic position of individuals is really that big a factor. And I know our Hawkshaw's book, but I think there's a risk of going into, particularly taking a geographic lens on a problem, so places outside the big cities that maybe are, are struggling. Mm -hmm. Geography can be very distorting. So part, the main reason, for example, that cities tend to have a low Trump vote or a low Brexit vote is because they have lots of three types of demographics, which are young people in their 20s, um, people with degrees, and ethnic minorities, all groups that are very low populist voting. When you strip that out, actually, if you take a white working class Londoner mm -hmm. and a white working class person anywhere else in the country, as likely to vote leave in London. So I'm not so convinced. So here's my yeah. fear. Okay. Here's my fear with that. If yeah. you try to strip out the other, I'll call them identity markers, like class, and let's say sex or gender, and talk about whiteness as an ethnic identity, it feels like you're crystallizing whiteness into an identity that you're advocating people stake their political claim in. And I'm not sure how that is going to move either the needle on the left or the right when it comes to um, you know, trying to defeat Trump in 2020, or to, you know, perhaps push against the kind of identity politics that are motivating a lot of the very left political agenda right now, because you're still advocating for identity politics just based upon whiteness, which does have a history of class and oppression in the United States. I, well, I'm not advocating for identity politics. What I'm sort of saying is so that... So white ethnic identity is not an identity. It is so, not they sh so white people shouldn't feel take meaning from their identity okay. as whites. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying... So what I'm saying is let's treat all groups equally. That if you try and suppress even a common humanity-based moderate white identity while encouraging a sort of common enemy type identity amongst other groups, that's not a good formula. What you want to uh -huh. do is say... Identity is fine, and that will influence... Not, it's not the case that all politics is identity politics, but it's, people are going to... Identities are going to affect politics, but it's got to be moderate, and it's got to be this common humanity-based identity. But how can you talk about white identity in the United States without talking about the history of racism? Well, because, I, again... Right, okay. <laughs> you, look... There's a history of racism, but... Okay, look, I, I think... 
Right, okay. Um, I think there's a difference between, again, hostility to outgroups and attachment to in-groups. Now, again, it's, it, you know, there is a distinction there to be made. I think to just say this identity is toxic because of a history and it's forever going to be toxic is it's simply a bad strategy, regardless of whether you think that's a, an ethical stance to take. I just think it's really not a good strategy uh, for, for progressives to take, to actually toxify that identity, which, as I've argued, is coming largely out of identification with ancestry and, and cultural attachments, simply because there may be an association in the past, which is very real, mm -hmm. but I just think to hang that forever but is But in your is imagination, what are the material elements of that attachment to one's family? To I mean, are we actually talking about apple pie and baseball? Because, I mean, I meant that as a metaphor. Right. <laughs> right. Well, people are attached to these identities. They, they, there may, if you take ancestry, there are kind of collective memories associated with that. There are symbols and traditions, family background. Um, I think to sort of rule that out of bounds on the basis of, of you know, drawing a connection back to you know, very real sins that were committed in the past, mm -hmm. and to say that that forever means that this identity is something that has to be repressed and others to be celebrated, even though actually if we scratch the surface of a lot of these other identities, we would find similar histories of you know, going back for, you know, to colonialism or whatever. I just think it's not a productive way to go. I think you want to have a moderation mm -hmm. of these identities, subordinate to liberal principles of equal treatment, for example. So but I what's think the story white people should tell themselves? Well, I don't think that white guilt is the right story. I think acknowledge the, the sins, by all means, that were committed by white groups who may or may not have been your ancestors. That's absolutely right. But I think to, to actually make that the definition of whiteness is mm -hmm. the sort of terrible so, stuff. I just think yeah. that's not productive. I think it's important to acknowledge absolutely, but actually to make that the defining feature is strategically just, I think, a bad move. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so I was, you know, I was reading your book at a bar the other night, and an African American woman sat down next to me, and she said, "What's that about?" And and I, I told her, and she put her hand on my arm, and she said, "Please go tell your people to chill the fuck out." Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, as as um, as one of our speakers said earlier, um, you know, it, it's I think there's a bit of agreement that. Um, you know, people are tired of, of white people saying, oh, I, you know, like, yes, I feel so bad, you know, because it's still then making the narrative all about white people. That's not quite your point, but I, I think it, it follows the same line of thinking. But you still haven't answered my question. What is the good story, then, that white people should be telling themselves, in your view, so that they still feel like they have meaning in their lives? Well, <laughs> wow, there's... A, um, <laughs> well, all, part of the story is that Particularly, identification with their ancestral group is fine, but even the white group has, I mean, sure, they've, they've done bad things and they've done good things, and most groups, you'll find that if you go through their past far enough. So I just think that they can take pride in building a, a civilization that's, by world historical standards, quite advanced, has flaws. Yeah, the same that any, any other group can tell a similar story about the good things they did, and, and that that's, mm -hmm. that should be defining the identity while not denying Right. So uh, many groups deny, you know, so that in Turkey they haven't come to terms with the Armenian genocide. Yeah, you don't want to be doing suppression, yeah. but you don't want to necessarily have to wallow in the sins every morning. So all I'm saying is, right. you know, that's the balance that I'm kind of looking for. Right, kind of like Ruskin self-flagellating right. on the way to the, to the bordello. There are questions. Okay, so um, student, yes, yes, please. Thank you. And then a student question, if, if there is one. I, I have um, a lot of responses, and, I'm, and many of them echo some of what, can you hear? Oh. Sorry. I have a lot of questions, and many, um, and, and I'm going to be selective. And also, I am echoing, I think, um, some of the things that Samantha um, has been um, articulating, and also the uh, person in the back. Um, I, I am a psychologist, um, I'm a clinician, so I don't do that much research, but I do um, read a lot um, in psychology and also um, American history and um, race, studies of racism. And I am very um, skeptical of data that is not located um, historically. Um, and 
I wanted to say that first. Um, so I understand that you don't want to get bogged down in a lot of, well, this is the history of this, and you know, yes, America did have slavery. Let's deal with the present uh, crisis around immigration, um, it, attitudes towards it, and um, uh, contemporary American politics um, and British. But to even um, think that we um, can talk about what it means to be white um, when there's a lot of research, I believe, historical research. I'm, I'm thinking particularly of Nell, Nell Irvin Painter's book, The History of White People, that um, makes a, a very persuasive case that racial categories were invented um, in the you know, 15th or 16th century. It very much had to do with the rise of colonialism. But that in, um, let's just say, America, the people who were considered white were um, largely Anglo-Saxon. And that many people that we would consider white today, including my Italian mother, um, were not considered white when they arrived. Um, and um, no, you know, and, and, and that in fact, in order to become white, Irish were not considered white. Um, and in to become white, they had to in fact give up a great deal of their ethnic identification and identify with the ruling powers in, in this country. I don't think that I agree that um, American history is most interesting to white people. I think you said that. Um, I think that white people should learn a new history that includes the fact that many, many different peoples, particularly black people brought here to be slaves, is the history of America. And so that's just some of my responses. My question is, you say that you write this book, you um, make three main arguments for what contributes to political differences around um, uh, immigration, and then you say um, these obviously, we, what we need to do is come to some accommodation and compromise. Um, I think that Obama tried to do that. I think that we have a candidate now, Joe Biden, who very much wants to do that. You say a lot of this is based in psychology. I do not see that having people come to this lecture or read your book or take classes even in the kind of research you're doing is um, at all sufficient to make your case. And I am wondering if you know people or you have worked with people who have really practical ideas about how to reach the accommodation and compromise that I'm sure all of us want to some extent. Thank you. Right, okay, so quite a bit there. I, um, you know, I agree with, I mean, again, this is a question of how do you heal these divisions which are extremely serious and growing. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't, I, the, the problem is I think both sides are gonna have to, have to give on this. You mentioned Biden and Obama. I, I think both of those figures would be good figures for addressing this, this issue. And I think Obama did it quite well. Uh, but, well, he did succeed in getting elected twice. Uh, right, but, but wait, but that's, okay. Uh, right, but then the, the, it was Clinton, not Obama, who was running. And so you had a big shift that, that occurs. And plus you have the issue of immigration. Trump was able to, to sort of capitalize on that because none of the other primary candidates were making that central to their pitch. But I think the Democrats 
I guess I would just say the approach of Biden and Obama would be a better one than, than what's being proposed by some of the under, other candidates who are not really addressing uh, the issue. Okay. Uh, is there a student question in the audience? I would love to have a student question. Okay, here. And then we'll, do, we'll take both. We'll take both. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, yeah. I feel like there's a big uh, contradiction in your argument, which is that on one hand, you have like a very kind of accepting view of whiteness as an identity. You kind of frame it as a relatively innocent thing, right? You say like there's a difference between solidarity with your own group and hatred of another. But then the whole argument of your book is that because of this solidarity, white people don't want non-white people coming into their countries, which it, I know it, it's just about immigration, but I think that if you look at the history of American immigration and all the legislation, even the existence of immigration debates as a matter of public policy, it's always been about non-white people coming to the country and attempts to restrict that. I mean, if you look at Ellis Island, for example, white people were flooding into the country. There was, no, it, there was never a question of documentation. You came in and if you were disease free, they would let you in, right? This existence now of an immigration debate where people are upset about immigrants coming in and they want to restrict it, it, it it's rooted in race and I have no doubt and I, I would be surprised if anyone did that if it were white people flooding across the southern border right now instead of brown people, the debate would not exist. Can, let's take, let's okay. take the second question and then you can, okay. we'll wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, so first I wanna thank you for um, truly I, energizing me and I think a lot of this audience. Um, and <laughs> uh, yeah. A compelling and it's a good I thing think, this late confusing in the conversation to start. Um, I just want to start. I, I know I walked in about five minutes late, um, and you touched on the, the notion of acknowledgement. And I'm not sure if you did this, um, but I apologize in advance. If you acknowledge, if you made a land acknowledgement when you started your presentation, and I think that there is an inherent contradiction in that. Um, and I'm really struggling at the core with your data and finding a space to feel optimistic about your finding this kind of middle ground when, on such divisive topics when the language you're using to create your data is inherently elitist and racist by using terms like Hispanic to, to cultivate data in this day and age it seems like really ineffective and confusing to me and I'm wondering who your audience is when you claim to be of a liberal mindset when you're using language of the right. Um, in, that, in that mindset, um, just have many notes. Thank Give you. Give me one moment. Um, on the notion of privilege and the idea that you can wake up in the morning and make a decision as to where you set your intention in terms of what you worry about, that is not a privilege that everyone has. And I want to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge, um, acknowledge the language that you use around economic precariousness, which is in fact poverty. Um, and with all of these critiques of the things that you have to say, I'm wondering where we might actually start the conversation. Because if at the core there is a conversation and I'm infuriated by much of what you've had to say, where might we have a dialogue? Thank you. If thank we're you. technically on the same side. We, 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 have, to, we have to keep going, but thank right. you. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, so to, to the first point here, some really good uh, points that I, I actually think what's happening now is not that different from what happened in the 1920s, for example, or other periods in other countries, in Scotland, in the interwar period with Irish migration, that essentially whenever you get these large-scale migrations and demographic changes, you tend to get populist movements pushing back on that, which you had in this country when it was white people. In Britain, the Brexit vote, a big chunk of that was about East European white immigrants, right? So now, of course, we can, again, we can play around with white and what that means. This is essentially people who are outside the ethnic majority population. Of course, over time, you have assimilation and you have redefinition of the boundaries of what it means to be white or, or what it means to be part of the ethnic majority. So I'm saying in the book, for example, that the definition of the ethnic majority will eventually encompass people who don't look white but have some sort of European heritage. So there's going to be this continual expansion of the meaning. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a... 
I'm not, you know, if, so I think we have an example of where there were white people coming into the United States and that didn't make a damn difference as far as the hue and cry over immigration. So I'm not sure that particularly holds. I, I think that, yeah, on the illegal front, the question is what, what the laws were at the time. If there weren't laws, if the laws were such that, in fact, you didn't need papers, then there's a slightly different situation than when the laws say you do need papers and people don't have them. So I think, again, it's, it's a bit of a, I'm not sure it's quite right to say that if they were white, there wouldn't be this debate, because I actually think there would be. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question. I probably haven't. I'm happy to continue it later. Um, the question over here, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, if, if you want to discuss evidence, uh, you know, it's very important to have, for any theory to be measurable and falsifiable. Right? I mean, otherwise, there's nothing to check a theory based on one's own preconceived notions. So there has to be some sense in which all of our theories can be disproven, at least hypothetically. This is sort of the Popperian method. So I guess I'm, I would be open to having any kind of a conversation uh, as long as there was this, this premise of falsifiability where we could go out and do a test or we could go and collect some evidence that could adjudicate between our competing views of the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and I think, I, and I didn't quite get, well, there must have been some second part of your question, sorry, I, I might have lost that. Did, did you want to expand on that or no? Okay. No, I think, I okay. think that uh, the conversation can continue right. uh, after the final panel during the wine and cheese reception. Please right. uh, join me in thanking Eric and myself. Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs>so i want to I want to congratulate you on getting to the last panel, which we're about to start. Um, uh, it should be uh, very exciting. The panel is um, thank you, Sam, and thank you, Eric. The last one is who needs anti-Semitism by Ruth Weiss. Um, I want to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Bacha Ungar Sargon. Uh, Bacha is an award-winning journalist uh, and opinion editor for the Forward. Uh, she's written a ton on anti-Semitism and Jewish issues for The Forward and other publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and Foreign Policy. She's uh, a voice I always go to when I need to know what's happening in the Jewish world. So, thank you, Batya, and um, we are set, and welcome, and I'm going to let Batya introduce the panel. Thanks very much. Welcome to the Hannah Arendt Center Conference on Racism and Anti-Semitism to the panel, Who Needs Anti-Semitism? I want to thank Roger and Tina. Um, this conference is already so incredible. I truly feel like I'm in the presence of greatness. The speakers have been incredible and I've already learned so much and I hope you're all enjoying it as well. Um, I'm really honored and humbled to be chairing this panel. I'm going to start by introducing our speaker, Professor Ruth Wise, and my fellow co-chair, Shani Moore. Then Professor Wise will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And after that, Shani and I will each pose a question or two to Professor Wise for discussion. And then I'm going to open it up to your questions. And of course, if there are students, um, please, please, uh, we want to prioritize your questions. Professor Wise is currently the Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Tikva Fund and the Martin Perez Professor of Yiddish Literature and Comparative Literature Emerita at Harvard University. Weiss won a National Humanities Medal in 2007 and is a frequent contributor to Commentary Magazine, Mosaic Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal. Professor Wise is known for the power of her scholarship, the fierceness of her intellect, and the unapologetic nature of her politics. She is described by her students as the kindest of teachers and the fiercest of advocates. Her books include The Shlemiel as Modern Hero, If I Am Not For Myself, The Modern Jewish Canon, Jews and Power, and No Joke, Making Jewish Humor. Shani Moore is an associate fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and a research fellow at the Chaikin Center for Geostrategy at the University of Haifa. He served as a director for foreign policies on the on the Israeli National Security Council. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wise.
Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Roger, and thank you for the organizers of this conference. Um, this is... Oh, perfect. Everything's good, sure. Um, I wrote out my comments because I uh, tend to trust myself too little these days. <clears throat> so, um, in the summer of 1992, the New York Times devoted its entire op-ed page to an article by Henry Louis Gates entitled, Black Demagogues and Pseudo-Scholars, warning that while anti-Semitism in, in America was generally on the wane, this is 1992, it was on the rise among black Americans, with blacks twice as likely as whites to hold anti-Semitic views. Moreover, research showed that anti-Semitism was most pronounced, quote, among the younger and more educated blacks. Gates was writing then as the newly appointed chair of Harvard's Department of Afro-American Studies, and as such, he was in a position to know and to feel concerned. And since I had just accepted and was about to begin a tenured position at Harvard, I paid close attention to this article. I knew that earlier that year, Harvard's Black Student Association had hosted Leonard Jeffries, professor of black studies at City College, who used the platform to denounce Jews for running the slave trade and to contrast the frigid whites of the world with the sun-warmed blacks. Also speaking at Harvard, Conrad Muhammad of the Nation of Islam had blamed the Jews for despoiling the environment and destroying the ozone layer. I think we're going to get a demonstration of what Henry Louis Gates was talking about. Um, so Gates cited these and other crackpot theories being peddled in black academic circles about Jews descending from brutish Neanderthals and of course, he cited the Protocols of the Elders of Zion that accused Jews of plotting to take over the globe. Make no mistake, he said, this is anti-Semitism from the top down, engineered and promoted by leaders who affect to be, sleep, to, who affect to be speaking for a larger resentment. I see that you're all fascinated by anti-Semitism in its present tense, and we are delighted to have a demonstration of what I am speaking about right here. Thank you so much for being the objects of this talk. There is no clearer thing that I can think of than to have a visual um, sign of the times. In any case, those of you who can hear me, um, Gates's account of black anti-Semitism included the reluctance to confront it. It is something most of us, as if by unstated agreement, chose not to talk about. There might be good reason for this, he said, since black America was still beleaguered, but one dared not ignore or minimize the problem because blacks could hardly defeat racism if they practiced it themselves. And he wrote, the moral credibility of our struggle against racism hangs in the balance. Gates may have been worried lest these spokesmen spoil the reputation of Afro-American studies in its infancy. But he was all... Are you all going to do this? Excuse me. Are you all going to do this? People, are you all going to do this? Interrupt us? You are supposed to be students at a university? Shame on you, honey. Equality is not shouting down someone who is different. It's opening your ears and listening. Shut up. OK. Uh, we were told that we would be able to have this panel without anti-Semitism being manifest. Is this the case or is it not? Well, then I would ask these people to please be polite and remove themselves. 
they shall be, they shall be removed. They shall be, they shall be removed, just like a log that's floating down the waters. They shall be removed. We will ask them to move to the side with the sign. No, I think they should leave. And so let me leave this aside and let me just tell you that what the greatest problem we have on campuses today is the organization of politics against the Jews. And one of the reasons for this is because other forms of racism, you see? I can do almost anything. Um, are you? Would, shall I continue? All right. Okay. Well, what I found most impressive about the candor of this piece, even more impressive than that, was the analysis itself. I was by then thinking and writing a lot about anti-Semitism, frustrated by the way it was usually treated and talked about. The great historian, my teacher, Salo Baron, had called anti-Semitism the dislike of the unlike. That sounds reasonable until you realize that the definition applies to all forms of prejudice. And then the foremost historian of anti-Semitism, Robert Wistrich, called it the oldest hatred, which didn't satisfy me either, because while anti-Semitism draws from earlier demonic images of the Jews, it's an instrument of modern politics, different in kind and requiring its own inquiry. I was especially troubled by the way Holocaust and Holocaust studies conflated anti-Semitism with Nazism. Hitler's war to eliminate the Jews was indeed the greatest enormity the modern world had yet experienced. But anti-Semitism was not confined to fascism or to Germany. It started on the left before it moved to the right. It appealed to internationalists at least as much as to nationalists. It excited secular and religious alike. It was non-denominational, egalitarian. Anti-Jewishness had to be understood through its political functions, which was exactly how Gates treated it in this op-ed. He did a far better job than the Anti-Defamation League. So I commend this article to you for your reading, July 20th, 1992, New York Times. But since black anti-Semitism is not my main subject here, I want to extrapolate from this analysis what it has to say about the generic features of anti-Semitism, what it is, how it works, and why it remains the world's most successful political tool. The article describes the power struggle within the black community between, on the one side, those like Martin Luther King, who wanted to normalize black politics by making common cause with fellow Americans, and on the other, leaders increasingly linked to Muslim militants who were using Jew blame to gain adherence and resorting to classic anti-Jewish tactics for, quote, a barricaded withdrawal into racial authenticity. And this is a quote from Gates's article. The strategy of these apostles of hate, I believe, is best understood as ethnic isolationism. They know that the more isolated black America becomes, the greater their power. 
And what's the most efficient way to begin to sever black America from its allies? Bash the Jews. These demagogues apparently calculate, and you're halfway there." End of quote. Gates was making the case in favor of liberal civil rights legislation, which ended segregation and banned discrimination in employment and voting in order to ensure equal opportunity irrespective of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. This was meant to consolidate what would be painstaking, imperfect, but incremental approach of the constitutional democracy against, on the one hand, anti-black racism, which persisted despite the laws against it, and on the other, the demagogues and ethnic isolationists who wanted political leverage through black power and used reverse racial bias to gain it. The article warned that if black intellectuals failed to rally, rally against this bigotry, they would be complicit in what cannot be condoned. Now, what about the Jews? How did Gates think they figured in this? He writes, the Jews could not understand how their political commitment to the civil rights struggle and the historic black Jewish alliance could have led to this situation. He quotes the aphorism, we can rarely forgive those who helped us, and says that the brutal truth is that the new anti-Semitism arises not in spite of the black Jewish alliance, but because of it. For precisely such transracial cooperation, epitomized by the historic partnership between blacks and Jews, is what poses the greatest threat for the isolationist movement. In other words, the Jews' liberal drive for equal opportunity and an end to discrimination stands in the way of grievance politics that wants equal outcome restitution, political power. The Jews are accused of wanting tolerance only so that they should be able to dominate. In conclusion, the article warns against bigotry as an opportunistic infection, attacking most virulently where the body politic is in a weakened state. It quotes Dr. King, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one, directly affects all indirectly. Black anti-Semitism weakens the body politic even further when it replaces one form of racism by another. Now, although this article is framed in moral terms, I prefer to discuss the problem it raises on political terms that are by no means limited to sections of black America. Odd as it may seem, Anti-Semitism is one of the most influential ideologies or political strategies of modern times. It's a politics of grievance that builds its political base by blaming others, in this case the Jews, and explaining problems as the fault of the Jews. In a healthy world, in a healthy democracy, liberal and conservative parties struggle for power, with the balance moving back and forth between them. You know how it is here. One party may favor strong central government, the other greater decentralization, and so on. Uh, but in any case, vying parties in this country realize that all solutions and resolutions must be reached between them. Anti-Semitism blames others for the real problems that it faces. We may think of it as the politics of the pointing finger, pointing at Jewish exploiters, Jewish landlords, Jewish communists, Jewish capitalists, Jewish occupiers, Zionist racists, the 1%. Whereas other ideologies have to offer constructive prog pr programs, anti-Semitism has the advantage of being wholly against. But since problems are real and the Jews are not their solution, Anti-Semitism misdirects awareness and worsens the situation into spiraling discontent. So I think the appeal of anti-Semitism is best understood through its political functions. Forged in Germany in the last third of the 19th century, it arose just as the op-ed describes. Um, in a political struggle between advocates and opponents of emancipation, 
Liberals were promising an open democratic society with greater opportunity for all, but many people feared and felt threatened by a level playing field that would be competitive as well as liberating. In the 1870s, Wilhelm Marr founded the movement for anti-Semitism in Germany, calling liberal democracy a ploy by the Jews to take over the country, the media, the law courts, medicine, culture, the economy. Instead of campaigning outright against liberal democracy, he campaigned against the Jews as its secret beneficiaries, call it German or Aryan isolationism. It was a brilliant strategy. And I think that we are remiss if we do not acknowledge anti-Semitism is a brilliant strategy. It should not, it could not have been so successful to this very day if it were not. And look why. Look at the political advantages that it offers in a popular struggle for popular opinion. One, it builds coalitions among otherwise contentious group. In Europe, it rallied conservatives who believed that you, the Jews were undermining traditional authority, radicals who accused Jewish capitalists and bankers of exploiting workers and the economy, extreme nationalists who said Jews were aliens corrupting the language and culture, and internationalists who said the Jews were a racist tribal throwback. Instead of attacking, instead of attacking liberalism outright, anti-Semitism seemed to attack only the Jews, in this case, only Israel, which made liberals themselves notoriously reluctant to confront it. Some said, maybe there's truth in the charge, and most just tried to ignore it. I think that's human nature. Although Marr was sincere in claiming that he was not a Christian who blamed Jews for killing of Christ, he drew on centuries of demonization that had made Jews a plausible culprit, a small people with a hugely inflated negative image. So the movement grew and gained strength, other ones of its functions. Anti-Semitism offered a, new, a neat explanation and solution for whatever was going wrong. If Jews were to blame for the crises, one had only to suppress or rid oneself of the Jews. Also, it redirected dissatisfaction away from deep and in some cases intractable problems toward one villainous element whose removal would seem to make more room for others. It offered an outlet for violence for those who needed it against Jews from whom there was always something to steal. And best of all, best of all, it was directed against a people with no incentive for counter-aggression who needed acceptance from precisely those who organized against them. The decisive moment in this movement came when politicians were elected on a platform of anti-Semitism, which began to happen at the end of the 19th century. Here was an anti-democratic movement that successfully harnessed the democratic process to gain power. May I add to all these functions of anti-Semitism, it is such fun. Have you noticed? <laughs> anti-Semitism is such fun because the Jews don't fight back and you don't have to be afraid of attacking the Jews. On this campus, for example, I'd like to see someone saying, you know, uh, the blacks should go back to slavery. Hmm, how many people do you see going that? But no, to say that Israel has to go back to slavery to undoing itself as a state, hey, you can get away with that. No fun, that. fun, this is fun. So by 1933, Hitler had taken over the government of Germany and other anti-Semitic parties were prominent in countries from France to Poland and Romania. But of course, that was only half its success. A parallel form of anti-Semitism took hold in the socialist and communist camp that opposed religion, nationalism, and commerce, and cast the Jews as the foul combination of all three. The Soviet Union condemned discrimination directed against Jews as individuals while outlawing Judaism, Jewish peoplehood, and Zionism, which is the right of Jews to their homeland. 
This ultimately proved the more threatening form of anti-Jewish politics, because whereas racial anti-Semitism explicitly excludes the Jews and leaves them no choice but to oppose it, the internationalist socialist form of anti-Semitism attracts many Jews under the banner of universalism, secularism, and repairing the world. So in 1929, Stalin welcomed the Muslim Brotherhood's attacks on the Jews in Palestine as the beginning of an Arab revolution and framed all the anti-Zionist slogans against Jewish imperialism and colonialism that are used today. Hitler condemned Jews as both communists and capitalists. Stalin condemned them as both nationalists and cosmopolitans. So you, you see here, the amazing protean force of this simple political tool. So from what I've said, you can see how seamlessly this political strategy moved from Europe to the Middle East. Since 1945, when the Allies won the war against Nazism, the generative force of anti-Semitism has been Arab and Muslim rather than European and post-Christian. In 1945, the Arab League coalesced against one unifying pan-Arab goal, the prevention of a Jewish homeland, and when that failed, the destruction of that homeland. Originally directed against the Jews in other people's lands, anti-Jewish politics was now directed against the Jews in their own land. And rather than cleansing Jews from other countries, Jews were now to be removed from their homeland on the grounds that the land itself belonged to another people. The demographic and political asymmetry between anti-Jews and Jews was even greater in the Middle East than it had been in Europe, which meant that this was the war that the Arabs might not win, but they could never lose. It grew even more lopsided when the fall of the Shah in Iran brought to power the theocratic Islamic Republic that conducts what it considers a holy war against the Jews. So the Latin phrase, cui bono, asks for who's good, applying the principle of utility to estimate the value of an act or policy. Applying the functions of anti-Jewish politics I enumerated above to Arab and Muslim leaders, you see how useful they have been in forming otherwise improbable coalitions of blame, redirecting dissatisfaction from internal problems to this foreign outpost of the West, providing an outlet for violence from the Palestinian pogroms in Palestine of the 1920s to Iran's support for Hezbollah and Hamas. Anti-Israel ideology originally used the language of the right. We will drive the Jews into the sea until 1975, having failed to destroy Israel in the wars of 67 and 73, Arab leaders joined the Soviet bloc to pass United Nations Resolution 3379, defining Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination. So, those who denied Jews the homeland, their homeland, claimed that the Jews were denying Arabs their homeland. They had not opposed Israel for displacing Palestinian Arabs. They opposed partition in order to keep Palestinians homeless as the perpetual battering ram and justification for their aggression. The Arab Soviet switch of per political terminology from the right to the left was the defining adaptation that reignited anti-Semitism for the 21st century. Anti-Semitism in its older xenophobic form could not have penetrated the, academic, the American academic and cultural elites from the right, but it had no trouble penetrating it from the left, adopting the Palestinian as poster child for, intersexual, for the intersectional coalitions of victimhood. So I wrote about 10 conclusions to this compressed discussion trying to clarify what the title of this conference might otherwise obscure. The yoking of racism and anti-Semitism can be important only if we distinguish one from the other. Anti-Semitism is not another form of hatred or prejudice or even racism, but it is the organization of politics against the Jews that is aimed at what they represent. This ideology and movement is not about the Jews, 
but about what its adherents want to prevent or destroy. And it is always about the destruction of something. Whether it is against liberal democracy, guarantees of, lib of equal opportunity, regional coexistence, Western civilization, or American exceptionalism, or the right of speakers to come and address an audience believing that they have the right to do so, whether it's against any of these, the Jews and Israel always stand for something much larger than themselves. To know what is going on, we have to look at what anti-Semitism is trying to deflect attention from, whom it is trying to attract, how and why it is spreading. We must never follow the pointing finger. The Jews are never the actual problem, and their disappearance can never solve it. Anti-Semitism simply needs them as its foil. So let me end. Right now, for what I believe is the very first time in American politics, anti-Semitism has penetrated the United States Congress, and its adherents are now electable on platforms that include anti-Semitism. They support a coalition of grievance minorities that want, through identity politics, to change the system into one-party rule of the allegedly oppressed. Several newly elected representatives see nothing wrong with promoting Arab-Muslim war against Israel as a legitimate rallying call to their fellow Muslims in their districts. And Columbia University sees nothing wrong with inviting the president of Malaysia to address nothing less than the World Leaders Forum. Henry Louis Gates, a lovely man, would never again write anything like this article because the identity politics that he deplored turned respectable, and what he was once afraid might discredit Afro-American studies now underwrites these studies. And if it includes anti-Semitism, tant pis, as we used to say in Quebec, too bad, tough. The politics of grievance has taken over the university, much of the media and popular culture, and a huge swath of the Democratic Party, and it is beginning to make a comeback on the other side of the political spectrum in the form of white grievance as well. Its target is the American polity that Martin Luther King aspired to and that many of us are determined to keep supporting and working to improve. I would just, as one word, Democracy is not biologically transmitted. It is a recent and difficult political formulation that the United States has developed to a very high level, but it is under serious attack, and the spread of anti-Semitism is putting it to the test. As for the Jews, in the same decade that the Germans and their profiteers murdered one-third of the Jewish people, other parts of that same people had begun the recovery of their homeland that had lain under foreign occupation for 2,000 years, serially occupied by Romans, Christians, Muslims, Ottomans, and British. The land of Israel is now the state of Israel. I consider this a human miracle greater than any of those registered in the Bible and a testament to what a slave people can achieve. So American Jews put great emphasis on educating their fellow Americans about the Holocaust. I have always considered this a political error. What we ought to have emphasized is the power of self-reliance, self-accountability, self-improvement, the foundational beliefs of the United States as well as of the Jewish people. And perhaps that may be the subject of the next conference at this center. Thank you. Woo. Thank you so much. I'm so glad our protesters had to hear that. <laughs> um, okay, so I have two questions for you and then I'm gonna pass it over to Shani and then I'm gonna open it up to the floor. Um, all right, my first question is, in the wake of the Pittsburgh Tree of Life massacre in which 11 holy Jews were murdered while at prayer, you wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in which you called it politically comforting to cast the murderer Robert Bowers as a neo-Nazi. You write, that a single shooter wants to kill the Jews is less dangerous to this country than Louis Farrakhan's smiling designation of Jews as termites, broadcast to a vast audience, or the vicious movement to boycott Israel. My question is, in casting the BDS movement, Palestine doing nothing is a crime. 
You have to leave now. You, you violated the college's code. You have to leave. My homeland is Jersey. <laughs> You're not in Jersey, buddy. Can, can you wait a second? Let me just. Can I just finish that? Yeah, I think mine does. All right, Bacek, please continue. I'm Can sorry I? about that. That's okay. You ready? I, I don't know if my mic works. I'll pass you mine. Okay. Um, okay, are we ready? Okay. My question, which the protesters would have loved, is um, in casting the BDS movement to boycott Israel and explicitly... Oh, for goodness sake, there's another demonstration. No, 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 he's, he's, he's a part of the conference. He's a, he is? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it looked very neat. In casting the BDS movement to boycott Israel, an explicitly nonviolent movement that many West Bank Palestinians credit with the radical drop in terror attacks against Israelis, in casting this nonviolent movement as more dangerous than actual murder, Aren't you, in a way, with all due respect, devaluing human life in suggesting that a political movement you don't like or that offends you is worse than murder? Doesn't that erase the difference between politics and violence? Isn't that something of an insult to the dead? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting... Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't Didn't minimizing, see that coming. believe me, my daughter lives in Pittsburgh uh, with our four grandchildren uh, of my daughters. I do not minimize the shooting of uh, people in a synagogue. By the way, they are synagogue goers. Um, that's not the point that I was making. I was making the point that um, lone shooters are a problem in this country. Mm -hmm. Lone shooters, if you've noticed, shoot. They shoot schools, they shoot from the top of uh, buildings in, in Las Vegas. Um, they are, of course, a problem, and of course, white uh, the few white supremacists that there are are a real political problem. But we're talking about we're, what we're talking about here is a worldwide war against the Jewish people that is the most lopsided war in human history, by now one of the longest. The Arab world occupies 500 um, million miles, five, 5 million square miles larger than the territory of the United States, and fights against a country of 11,000 square miles that it wants to annihilate. This is the world that we live in. And this is the movement that they are now spreading, that has re-entered uh, the United States, that has re-entered Europe. This is a worldwide political movement that is meant to bring down governments I don't see that in white supremacy here in the United States of America. And I think that Jews feel very comfortable fighting the war that, ha that was won in 1945. That they say that they thought that the Holocaust would make them immune to other attacks on the Jewish people. It hasn't been the case. So I, I think that one has to get serious here. By the way, the BDS movement began in 1945 because the Arab League, one of the first things that it did was to organize an economic boycott against Israel. And that the BDS movement is the direct result of the economic boycott that was originally launched by the Arab League. It's just an extension of that now in the modern world. And it's what is it meant to do? Is it really meant to limit Israeli uh, economy? No. It's meant to do exactly what it did in this audience, to make Israel the subject. I am sure that on Bard campus, as on Harvard campus, there was not a protest against what was happening in Syria. No, not a tear shed for the thousands and thousands of Arab children who are being killed and massacred by fellow Arabs. No care for them. Why? Because the pointing finger points away from all those dysfunctional Arab worlds at Israel, Israel, 
Israel, Israel. So that's the, that is the function of BDS. It's not even whether it's successful or not successful on a campus. It's just make Israel the subject, keep it there. It is the villain, it is the villain. And I, I think that this is, as I say, the most brilliant political strategy of modern times. So I, oh, yes, of course. Does this work? Yeah, yes. Yo, I can be heard. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to give too much respect to the, okay. <clears throat> I don't want to pay any unnecessary honors to the rather wretched spectacle that was here in front of us, but I think that the slogan that we heard at the end was deeply revealing. Um, so there's concern here about um, a set of racial instincts in Simon's Rock and the classic, uh, almost distilled uh, essence of anti-Semitism as an organizing political principle, as a, as a political ideology and even as a theology, is that the problem of the day is encapsulated there. When you chant something like from Simon's Rock to Palestine, you're essentially saying, oh yes, the explanation for my immediate problem here, for the evil I can identify, is, well, I'm not gonna say with the Jews, I'm gonna say with Israel. Um, it's hilarious almost to deny the intellectual genealogy of that because the power of that slogan is only there, it's, its ability to influence us, its catchiness, its charisma is only there because we're all aware of that genealogy. Otherwise, it would just be an inane rhyme. I, I think that was accidentally uh, but rather fascinatingly, very revealing about this whole thing. And the other thing that would be very revealing, and perhaps Roger can, can interject here, is there have been a lot of controversial topics discussed today, and a lot of controversial topics discussed on this stage at all of these conferences every year. This only seems to happen with Jewish speakers. It only seems to happen with people who want to tie, tie it into, it only seems to happen when people want to tie this into Israel. How about now? Okay. Sorry. Uh, how far back do I need to go in the... Uh... <laughs> the last sentence. Right. There are a lot of controversial topics here discussed on this stage. There were quite a few very provocative things said today that were super interesting, but very provocative things that were said on this stage from morning until right up until the moment the three of us got on the stage. And there have been a number of controversial topics discussed at this annual conference. This spectacle that we saw, this only happens with Jews. It only happens under the cover of discussing Israel. Israel could be a horrible state and a horrible country, one of the worst. This should still raise some questions. This still, I think that uh, I certainly, and uh, Professor Weiss especially, who's been around for much longer than I have and has a much in more interesting biography than I do, is entirely entitled to say, why is that? We're allowed to ask. So, so my next question would be to that point. Um, it seems to me that there's a difference between a politics that's organized around Jews, qua Jews, and a politics that's organized around a sovereign state that happens to be made up of Jews. Um, I see why it would be tempting to, to see those as one and the same. Why the obsession with Israel, the obsession with Israel, and there are so many. But, but the fact is, Israel is a sovereign state that is committing human and civil rights abuses. Um, so in a way, to me, isn't there a danger in treating that as the same as anti-Semitism that targets Jews who don't have an army specifically to protect them? Do you understand what I'm, the question? I do understand. I do understand the question, and it always comes back to the question of what can't I criticize Israel? Um, of course, you know this is the most. You're talking about the most self-critical people that ever was invented. Um, so uh, we criticize all the time, and there's plenty to, to criticize here and there and everywhere. This isn't criticism. This is blame. Israel is not being criticized, it's being blamed. It's being blamed for the problem and the suffering of the Palestinians. It's being blamed for the problem of the Arabs. It's the being blamed for the 
problem that only the Arabs created and only the Arabs can solve. And the Jews do not bear, let me say, an iota of blame for any of the problems in the Arab world. The Arabs, no more than the Jews who were blamed for the problems of the Poles, that they were preventing the rise of the Polish middle class. Well, you know, there was more justice to that than there is to the fact that Jews are holding the Arabs back. What, the Arabs in Palestine and the rest of, of the West Bank could not have created a, a federation with Jordan? And they couldn't have become like the Jews? They couldn't have built orchestras? You know that the Palestinians are the most, second most literate people in the Arab world? How, how much do you see coming out of the Palestinian world? It's only because they blame and they blame and they blame. Okay. So excuse me, no, so I think it is exactly the same thing as I said. Before, politics was organized against Jews in other people's lands because it's the function, you're not following what I'm saying. Look at the function of anti-Semitism. Why do the Arabs need it? Why do they use it? Why do these groups want it? I'll tell you why these groups want it. Do you know why these groups want it? Because you could not get up here in this auditorium, as I said before, and you could not be racially against blacks, gays, any other group, because you get sensitivity training for that. And you'd be thrown off the campus faster than you could say your name. But allowing it for the Jews, that is allowed. It's, we, we, and Jews join in on it, and they say, of course. Well, if it's allowed, and if it's the only form of protest that is allowed, and the only form of violence that is allowed, and the only form of blame that is allowed, of course you're going to have it. And that's the simplest explanation politically. And of course it's aimed against Israel because Israel is a Jewish state. The Jews are now in their country, so you attack them in their country. If they're in other people's countries, you attack them in other people's countries. Um, so I want to open it up to questions. Are there any students, first of all, any students who have a question? Um, no, I want to restrict it to people in this room. <laughs> any student? Yes. Angela. I'd like to ask why your conception of anti-Semitism is I'm so sorry, where, where are you? Uh, she's right in the back by the door, in front of the door. Oh, okay. okay. So okay. thank you. Okay. I'd like to ask why your concept of anti-Semitism is so inextricably linked to Palestine and Israel, given that it seems like a lot of your grievances with anti-Semitism have to do with cultural differences and not ethno-geographical states. Thank you. Well... What I was trying to present is a, um, an answer to the question of how is it that anti-Semitism plays the part that it does in the world? There are now maybe 13 million Jews in the world, five million fewer than there were in 1939. Do you know how many other people there are in the world? Why does it play the role that it does in the United Nations? Why does it play this role on campuses? I mean, you need an answer for these questions. And you can't just say this is hatred or this is whatever it is. There has to be an answer. I will tell you what, how I come to think of it. You know, the AIDS epidemic swept this country. It was a very interesting thing. AIDS was a horrible disease. Nobody had really seen this before. Now, did they raise a museum to AIDS? No. Did they write the history of AIDS? No. What did they do? They went about looking at the variables, looking at why it worked, how it worked, how it spread, because the idea was that, that they wanted to cure AIDS. Now, I want to cure anti-Semitism. So what I look at is why it works, how it works, where it works, whom it serves, where it surfaces. This is the way you start to analyze a question. And that's how I come to what I come to. Anti-Semitism? There is no other country around which uh, a, a politics of an ideology of extermination is organized. 
How do you blame a whole country for a problem that has existed long before the conflict of Israel and Palestine? Anti-Semitism goes back to it centuries. Yes, you know? it does. But anti-Semitism, as I said, the word itself, the movement itself, arose under very specific political conditions. It arose in Europe in tandem with the rise of democracy, if you believe it, because it's a way of rousing political, attracting political uh, allegiance, attracting people who follow it. In so any case, I'll tell you, uh, let me just answer more quickly. You know, I've written about this. If you're a thinking person, I have a book called Jews in Power. Um, read it, and I try to explain why the Jews serve this particular function, how they come to serve this particular function, and why it succeeds. I Any other students? You. Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to s clarify that people didn't just start it off wanting to fight AIDS. People called it the gay cancer for the longest time. And also, they were isolated from the entire community. If the gays didn't fight back, fight for the longest time, no one would have paid attention to even going on about to research it. And also, AIDS was killing people, like, directly. So I don't quite see the correlation here, but bringing it back to my question would probably be, I don't think anyone's blaming people who are, people who are just trying to live, trying to make a living for themselves, where Palestinians once tried to cultivate the land and now has, now those land has turned into concrete, which is constructed by Israeli government. I think not a lot of people really love their government. I have friends from Israel, and they've personally expressed interest in learning about what their government is doing. And I think just to blame it entirely on the rest of the world, it's, to say the least, a very interesting statement. So my question would be, how do you define how, or how do you identify the anti-Semitism? Or you're just certainly not quite agreeing what a government is doing to a certain group of people who have lived on the same land, even coexisted together for the longest time together. And now one has to destroy the other. Um, so, sorry. Um, my, um, I define anti-Semitism quite precisely as the organization of politics against the Jews. And uh, that is my succinct definition of it. Um, and uh, you can apply it and you can see, and I, what I try to look at as, is its functionality. And um, as for, um, um, I, I don't know, there was a, sorry, there's a um, point in your question that I had wanted to address uh, more specifically, but I guess it's late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if it comes to you, let us know I and will. we'll find. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, yes, young man. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, I have two questions and one comment. I was wondering, you know, you said earlier that you're keen to cure the world of anti-Semitism, which is very optimistic and interesting. Would that inquiry um, go on to include what's happening with Ethiopian Jews in Israel? Because as you know, I'm also a Semite. I'm non-Jewish, but I consider myself to be a Semite. And I know there's been an influx of uh, Jews from Ethiopia over the past few decades to Israel. So I'd really be willing to get your perspective on what anti-Semitism means within the context, having heard you talk about, you know, uh, black anti-Semitism. What would that look like from your point of view in terms of um, how that would then address the crisis that we now see with the mistreatment of Ethiopian Jews in Israel, or at least that's how part of the media has portrayed it. That's one question. My second question, uh, in your um, you know, um, perspective as someone who's trying to fight anti-Semitism, does that, um, does, does such an insight have scope to include any critique of the treatment of Palestinians by the Israeli government or not? And the third comment I'd like to make is, you've made analogies that have been quite, um, uh, I feel, simplistic. You know, you've referred to perhaps uh, we'd never go back to telling uh, black people, you know, go back to slavery. You've made analogies to AIDS. I think uh, there's a danger in doing that because it's very essentialist, and I think it's important to dive deeper into 
the specificity of these phenomena, and, I, and I'm not condoning anti-Semitism, but I think it's wrong to make analogies that drive your argument and then sort of almost sort of, um, you know, undermine, you know, d different sort of stages in history that have led to uh, the suffering of, say, blacks or the AIDS crisis having been a stigma of, of as the gentleman just said, a, a sort of a, a gay community. So I'm, I'm really throwing out two questions and making a comment. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your comment very much. Uh, I especially appreciate what you say about differentiation because this is a point that is very clear to me. So I would really uh, not like to be misunderstood. I was not making this comparison. I was just saying that it occurred to me that the way to go about it is in a diagnostic way. That's what I meant by AIDS. I meant that you went about solving the problem through diagnosis through kind of a scientific kind of inquiry into this, right? And that's what I suggest that one begins to do. So I, I don't notice schools, um, you know, that study political science and that have a phenomenon which is as extraordinary as the phenomenon of the persistence of anti-Semitism in modern times. And it isn't really subjected to the same kind of scrutiny so your point about differentiation, I take very seriously, and I really want to make that point. I've tried to differentiate anti-Semitism from other forms of hatred, discrimination, and so on and so forth. Um, as far as, as you know, I've, oh, I have uh, gone against my own principles uh, in a way, because one of the things that I would suggest to everyone, if you are talking about Israel, the Middle East, or anything which is going to involve Israel in the Middle East, you do not have the discussion without a full-scale map of the Middle East. Not a map, excuse me, not a map of Israel. And you are doing the same thing. Well, you know, I'm not going to start talking to you about Israel and how it treats Ethiopians and, and this is a problem within Israeli society, which it is solving, it seems to me, as well as any other society is solving, excuse me. But what I do want to know is, what about that map of the Middle East? Why are you not asking about these I questions? I don't disagree with you on that, actually. I think it's a valid so that, point. But that then is the what, point. what about looking... This is the subject of this... If we're speaking about anti-Semitism, how about looking at the contemporary face of Israel and looking at what's happening with Ethiopian Jews, for instance, uh, and who, who consider themselves to be Jewish and Semitic? Uh, how, well, would you, how would Jews you include, how would you include that case study into your inquiry about anti-Semitism? Would you acknowledge that there's something odd about uh, fellow Semites treating other Semites um, oh, poorly, please. you know. Why don't I mean, you, yes, okay, look. Would you at least be, be I would like to, to see it? another country that has gone, as the Israelis have done, into Ethiopia, into India, to bring out the people who call themselves Jews, to bring them to the country, to try to integrate them into the country. I'd like to find another example. America... That doesn't answer the question, though, okay. really. It doesn't I, I, I the don't question. It doesn't I will not, certain, excuse um, me, my um, subject of anti-Semitism is I will not make Israel the subject. The subject is the organization of politics against Israel. That is my subject. Internal Israeli politics is my problem as a Jew, your problem as a Jew or a non-Jew, whatever you want, that's different. Anti-Semitism is a huge entity, and I will not deflect from that, that thing to, to, to any other internal issue. Of course Israel has problems, it's a democracy. It'll have problems that may be, as you said, the worst country that still doesn't, that does not change the question of anti, it's not being attacked for how bad it is, it's being attacked for how good it is. I think that's a great exchange to end on. Thank you so much. And thank you all, you were really, really great. Thank you. Can I actually just, can we actually, we have one more question on this side, if you'd be willing. There's one more question on this side, if you'd be willing. Thank you all. Uh, we will reconvene tomorrow at 9.30. Uh, I wish you all... And now we're night. leaving the twilight zone of Planet Likud. <laughs>